You're listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick. Hi, I'm Hamish. And I'm Scott. And today Hamish is going to speak to us about mind share versus market share. Yes. Sounds pretty intriguing. Um, would you like to lead us off and just describe what the difference oh, is? Okay, well, I didn't even know what mind share is, so <laughs> let's start there. Well, mind share is just my way of explaining the dynamics of a brand because in dealing with the people that we deal with for the purposes of this podcast, we're dealing with inventors, product designers, you're an industrial designer. The focus is getting something on a shelf. Now, when we're focusing on getting something on a shelf, we're talking about the concept of market share. So looking at what price point that product is, where is it gonna sit literally on the shelf? Yeah, which, which audience are we going after? How much are they going, are they willing to spend? Who are the competitors in that market? You have to look at that in terms of your measurement of marketing effectiveness in terms of market share. The other but, thing that's important there is market penetration, which is how you get it on all the shelves. Yes. Which is a really tricky one as well. Yes, but you'll often hear, especially in the financial press, they'll talk about market share. Like a company, if it's not doing well, its market share has slipped. What I was just talking to you about before, though, if we take a, a, a well-known brand like Apple, now it has more than anything mind share. Yes, it has market share, but the way it operates and the way it has managed and built up its brand historically, because it's been on operation and in its current guise, you know, being where it is in the market for about, let's just say 20 years, maybe just a little bit less than that now, uh, with its branding strategy, it has a, a significant mind share, which is very hard to penetrate. So even though a product like the iPhone, I feel now the iPhone market is, it, they're almost commodities. Yeah. You know, their Samsung has come in they've managed to get around patents that in the first instance iPhone, or Apple, sorry, was worked very hard at patenting the first iPhone, iPhone 3G or whatever it was called. Uh, and they even made a point, Steve Jobs at the launch expo for that phone, I remember him saying they had patented the hell out of the iPhone. Everyone thought, well, yeah, great. Okay, so they're the only company to go to. And they were for many years, but all it did really, when you say that, when you go out to the market and, and announce that, Really, you've just got to employ the best brains, if you're Samsung and other manufacturers, to get around the patents. So you just use design in your favour in that sense. And look, Apple did go after them for a while and they were successful on some fronts. But as, a, as you and I as consumers, the, we can buy, we don't have to buy an iPhone to get a smartphone. There are a number of other products out there. So, but what counts with Apple though, going back to all this, is they still have significant mind share. There is still this perception that Apple does create a very good, high quality product. It will operate in a specific way. Uh, and they, they defend that more so than anything now. They will, if you look at their marketing now, it's all about how good the product looks, who's using it, uh, the different uh, unique color schemes they come up with, which are very subtle. I mean, I was just, I had a friend the other day, he'll, if, if he's listening to this, he'll know who he is. He kept asking about, oh, you know, should I upgrade my phone? Because I love that new green that they're coming out with. <laughs> And that's what counts. Yeah, that's not nothing to do with the functionality of that product. But he's already it's bought into it. He's it, when you say mind share, it seems to me that there's it, it's occupying their more, mind more than the other brand, and that's mainly I, I but imagine that's powerful. There's a certain amount of loyalty that's involved in that. So the brand's generated a, a loyalty to that brand oh, yes. through its marketing and through its yes. offering, and um, they've t to me for me Apple is very much a user centric product. Well, it used to be when Steve Jobs was, Jobs was at the helm. Everything yeah, but what I'm saying is, that if we get beyond that, is we don't user. when we're when we're buying products, when we, we go into a shop or we decide to buy a particular product, we're often we, we we like to think we use our head, not our heart. But unfortunately, we use our heart a lot, mm. and we rely on brands to guide us. Or so we don't rely. On, brands do guide us in yeah. terms of our decision making because yeah. something is inherently wrong with one brand that we can't be associated with. And yep. we're not thinking about that consciously. We just know that some brands, and this is the thing, a lot of, like, especially with automotive brands, a lot of automotive manufacturers get away with murder in terms of the quality that they mm. provide mm. because they're relying on an historical brand. Yep. That's their luxury. And they can do that what they will in, in ter in, until that runs out. Yeah. But if we're looking at, if we're talking about, again, we'll bring this back to reality, to our inventors, you've got to look at how do you, try and start building mind share as much as market share mm. because that allows you then to go on to build say other products in the future yep. that you can attach a certain amount of image to the new product which is unknown because let's face it if you if this is the first time into the market with a new product 
it's, it is an unknown quantity mm. and that's where you get into brand strategy where you can attach certain elements yeah. uh, to build familiarity with that new product but you do that within the brand that's when you start building up the mind share when you start selling things then you get market share mm. and then the two work hand in hand moving forward in, in, in order to protect your revenue which is your brand which is your image which becomes everything and that's why companies that have been around for 50 100 years i mean they rely so much on their mind share more so than their market share yeah. to propel new products and innovation forward because that gives it a particular flavor mm. and gives gives the customer a sense of security that's what you're providing with brand is security in a yeah. lot of sense well, I'd, I'd say when i look at apple i'd say that they were quite disruptive in their early early um, offerings and they basically stepped outside of the norm to offer the customer what they wanted mm. and it made it easy yeah well that's and, the thing the and first that's why they got this loyalty behind them that surpasses all other mm. because they know I'll, I'll, apple looked after me in the beginning they're still looking after me now i like the way their products use mm. work and they built this this loyalty behind behind the brand yeah yeah but, but it's, it's almost it's everything almost they a... do is about the customer you know and that's what they aim at and they they try and make it user friendly and all the rest of it and so that's that's worked for them but it, it does highlight the fact that when you get in early and say the same message all the time and disrupt a market, it can see you through competitors. Mm. And this is what you were talking about before as well. Competitors will come. There's no way around it. Sometimes it's Oh, a because good thing. markets are dynamic. Market, yeah. The competitive landscape need, is fluid. And, and that's what need, people have to remember is, to is, is uh, competitive, the, the, well, what I call it, it's the competitive landscape. So whatever, let's just say this week, your product on the shelf sits within a particular competitive landscape. Next week, someone comes along and offers an alternative. It could just be a, a slight change to what you've done, but let's just say they've gotten around a patent, they uh, are able to design and sell their version of what you've done. Mm. Now, your competitive landscape has then changed. What are you gonna do about that? Now, you can change your product at great cost, but if you're also building up a brand at the same time, you can then start to defend that. You can start defending the difference, what makes your product different. Otherwise, yeah. if you don't if you don't have that, you're going to have to spend a lot of money playing catch up all the time. So that's what I mean. There is a balance. You need both. You need good. Mark, you need to look at market share. But you also need to look at mind share, yeah. which is getting so into the minds of consumers. So they know when they look at you and your product, they're thinking something. They're thinking that means quality. That means speed. That means less cost. Yeah. I think I, I look at um, what Apple's done. They didn't really change their message. Is that important as well? And obviously, if they had to change their message halfway through because of the competitors, then they may have just become a Me Too product as well. But they mm. stuck with their stuck to their guns and stuck with their original message, which was all about quality and user friend, uh, user user interaction and user user um, enjoyment. Um, you know, it seems to me they stuck to their guns and their brand stayed strong. If they had have just swayed with the tide, they may have just become another another Me Too smartphone. But they've really Kept them, kept above the game by defending their brand that they had mm. and working to, working through. Yeah, it. and they still trade off that. I mean, if you look at the cost of iPhones, I mean, they're significantly. I well, yeah, I think it's significantly expensive, yeah. more expensive. They still sell them, obviously, so they're not backing down. And, and obviously, that price point, that price tag, is part of that image. That's what people have to remember. You're paying extra for the brand there now. You can't tell me that a Samsung is significantly more robust or better quality. Than an iPhone, it's not, well. It, it, there may be some differences there, but it's not a significant difference. Mm. What Samsung doesn't have is the mind share. It doesn't have the brand, because Samsung, unfortunately, also makes another uh, swathe of products which have got nothing to do with phones. I mean, you, you're talking about a product that makes air conditioners uh, and all sorts of other different products. So there's a lot going on with yeah. that brand. Yeah. Uh, Apple just sticks to the one thing. Mm. That's what. But anyway, we're talking. So much about Apple, but <laughs> but I will make another. Well, Dyson point. does the same thing. They're, they're yes. significantly more expensive, and you could argue that, that does the same thing. Takes, yeah. takes dead out of the carpet. <laughs> you know, and in the end, it's not a very glamorous product, but it, they you know, command a much better price because no, they've, they've, they've sort of they've sort of you know focused it around what it does for the consumer. And well, see, their their mind can. share comes back to the way they market, and you always whenever you think Dyson, you think someone has really spent, and which they have an awful amount of time working at the best way to take dust out of the carpet. And the way, if you look at all their marketing, it's all to do with the di the, the, the mechanics of the product. Mm -hmm. It's not the facade, I mean, the facade's great as well. I mean, you look at the actual, the way they encase these vacuum cleaners and fans, I mean, they're tremendous pieces of visual design, but also they market and say, well, the inside counts as much as the, the outside. 
and that's where they get whenever you think Dyson you think well, you're buying a tech it's a technical product it obviously is better I know mm. I don't know whether they take dust out of the carpet any better than any other well, vacuum cleaner we just had to buy one so <laughs> <laughs> we did the whole process there's infinitely better versions of stuff that takes dust out of the carpet <laughs> and for cheaper but but, but, but you know, no actually they're much more expensive but you know in the end like I'm not spending three grand on a bloody vacuum cleaner mm. <laughs> that's what's said to my wife <laughs> it's not happening <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, excellent. So, so but it but sounds to me that the, the point make... of this one is is really that you need to focus as much on your brand as a technical offering because you're going to get competitors, and the only way to make it robust against your competitors is stick to your guns with your brand and defend that as much as. Oh, your... and, but um, but and that's the thing. I'm not saying that brand is important just for the sake of, of its being there, and you need something to put on the the box of the product. You use it strategically because. It is a tool like anything else in your armory where you've got good design, you've worked on your brand, you've got something on the shelf. What are you defending after that? You've got to build your brand. Otherwise, you can build your product, but you know, I mean, if Ford, if all they're going to do is build the Model T and nothing else, well, uh, you know, the, things have to progress. Markets change, markets shift. And if you, that's the other thing too, like if you come up with something which is truly inventive and truly, uh, if you're going to significantly help, the customer then you're progressing a market you're you're the one that's pushing the barrier but unfortunately with what they call first mover advantage that can be disadvantage because all you've done is provide then a new you've, you've uh, pushed the boundary so far that someone else can come along and think about well how do we push this even further and so you know you're focused on maintaining your status quo and saying well, we've got the best product but then someone else has come along and gone well i can make an even better mouse track mm. so you've got to be focused at that that's why you build brand uh, awareness and that's why you build up brand uh, mind share is because it gives you that flexibility if you're lucky and it gives you that space to say okay well now we're building up a brand in the marketplace as much as we've got a product on the shelf selling what else can we do? It gives you some space, some breathing space. And that's the important thing with any marketing is to give you some breathing space. Is to say, okay, we're building up an image. Now what? What can mm. we do? What can we do to push further? Mm. How do we push our own product further? Or how do we get something else that's new that we can then lend our brand to help that, uh, to accelerate the uh, launch of that product into the market? So I understand, I mean, it's some, sometimes actually having a competitor, especially when it's a disruptive product, can be beneficial mm. because it's, it helps educate the market about what they need the product and if you're out there by yourself you're disrupted the market and you're trying to uh, educate the market by yourself it can be overwhelming mm. uh, marketing exercise but uh, two or three people doing the same thing educating the market and actually help your own brand so mm. then it's a matter of sticking to your guns and getting you keeping mm. your brand oh it's nothing like a bit of healthy competition i mean it's, yeah. i think that's the, the the joke i've always used with clients you know you get if you get a a, a suburb with one cafe that cafe is not going to do very well you put three cafes on the same corner in that street, they'll all do very well because all of a sudden you've got comparative value. You've got difference and you can see the difference. If you can't see the difference, what's the point? You've got to spend a lot of time marketing that one thing. So that's why, again, if you've got a product which is so far removed from everything else that's currently available, some that can be a bad thing in terms of you fall into that uh, trap of being complete, of being unique thinking this is gonna sell itself. You have to have comparative value. So do something which is different in the product, but use your branding to provide that comparative value. Then mm. you know, so they can see where it fits and how it will, because people are conservative, you, know, you don't wanna buy something which is not tried and tested, which yeah. some of these products are in the first in the first instance anyway. Yeah, definitely, it's very small. Part of the bell curve, the early adopters. Mm. So really, for a lot of the clients that we deal with, brand is there to provide security and, and uh, familiarity uh, in that marketplace. Yep. All right. Nice, 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 um, nice podcast, Hamish. Thank you very much for that insight on mind share versus market share. Thank you, Scott. You've been listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick.